Hi, my name is Dr. Gail Galetta, and I'm Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at the University of Massachusetts. And today I'm going to give the fourth year medical student headache lecture on behalf of JEDI, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion section of AAEM. So my emergency medicine interests include the development of emergency medicine in Norway. I lived and worked there 10 years ago and helped to get the specialty of emergency medicine um, approved by the Minister of Health. I am also passionate about gender equity and I am the chair of IFEM's Gender Specific Issues Special Interest Group. And I'm also passionate about environmental health, which I like to call intergenerational equity. So the objectives of today's lecture. By the end of this lecture, participants will be able to recognize life-threatening causes of headache, characterize and treat non-life-threatening headaches, and perform an occipital nerve block with supervision to treat certain types of headaches. And why is this important? Well, two to 4% of patients who present to the emergency department present with a headache. And the majority of these patients have a benign cause of their headache. So our job is to find the needle in the haystack and try make sure we identify those patients who have life-threatening causes for their headache. And why can't we just CAT scan everybody? Well, CT scans emit quite a bit of radiation. So one CT scan of the brain is equivalent of about 140 chest X-rays. So it's not safe to get a CAT scan on every patient who um, presents with a benign headache. And this is so important that the American College of Emergency Physicians in 2013 made it the number one item on their Choosing Wisely campaign. So they recommend to avoid CT scans of the head in emergency department patients with minor head injury who are at low risk based on validated decision tools. What kind of um, validated decision tools can we use? One popular one is the Canadian CT head rule for minor traumatic brain injury. And basically you would only get a CAT scan if a patient is at high risk. So these are patients with a GCS score of less than 15 at two hours after the injury, a suspected open or depressed skull fracture, any sign of basilar skull fracture, and this can in, uh, include raccoon eyes, battle sign or hemotympanum, vomiting more than twice, and age greater than 65. Patients at moderate risk for traumatic brain injury include amnesia before the impact and a dangerous mechanism, including a pedestrian struck by a motor vehicle, uh, passengers ejected from a vehicle, or fall from a height. In children, we can use PCARN rules to help determine who needs a CT scan, who can be observed, and who can be discharged. So basically, you want to look for a mental status change, Glasgow coma score of less than 15, or in children less than two, a palpable skull fracture, and in children two years older, signs of a basilar skull fracture. If none of these are um, present, you can observe patients if they've had a loss of consciousness greater than five seconds, if they have signs of a non-frontal hematoma in infants, if they're not acting normally or have a severe mechanism. Um, in older children, if they have a severe headache, they also need to be observed. Otherwise, they can be discharged home. Okay, now I'm going to show you a video to help you remember the red flags for a headache in adults. Hangover, 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 over, over, hangover, 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 over, over. Body's over, it ain't over. Try to make a back of man, but we over and over. Hangover, 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 uh, severe causes of headache. And these are SNOOP, systemic signs and symptoms, neurologic signs and symptoms, sudden onset of the headache, um, older age greater than 50, and a pattern change from previous headache. The way I learned about red flags is to think about first, worst, or neurologically cursed. These patients all need head CTs. <laughs> 
Now we're going to discuss some of the more life-threatening causes of headache. First one we're going to discuss is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and there are different types. Most of them are aneurysmal, but a small percentage are non-aneurysmal, and this can include trauma, arterial venous malformation, and neoplasm. These patients will present typically with a thunderclap headache. They'll often have mental status change, vomiting, and neck pain or stiffness. The diagnosis is by head CT, and in patients who have a negative head CT um, after six hours of presentation, uh, it has been taught previously that these need to be followed up with a lumbar puncture. Although this guideline is changing, I'm going to discuss that in the next slide. Uh, management of subarachnoid hemorrhage includes stabilizing the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation, make sure the patient is normotensive, correct any coagulopathy, nemotipine for vasospasm, and then plus or minus seizure prophylaxis. And of course, you'll need to consult neurosurgery. So just in 2021, in the Annals of Emergency Medicine, two back-to-back -back articles were published, one stating that lumbar puncture is necessary for ruling out atraumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, six hours after symptom onset, and the other article right afterwards that lumbar puncture should not be routinely performed for subarachnoid hemorrhage after a negative head CT. Head CT is very, very sensitive in picking up subarachnoids, but it's not 100%, and that's why some people are still recommending to perform the lumbar puncture. It is quite controversial at this time, and I would keep an eye open for future recommendations. If you do do a lumbar puncture to uh, rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage, you would look for an increased opening pressure of greater than 20 millimeters of water. You would also look for red blood cells that are not decreasing from tubes one to four if it is a traumatic tap. And then finally, you'd look for xanthrochromia, which is what is demonstrated here on the tube to the right. It's a yellowish tinge from the breakdown of hemoglobin. Okay, next is a subdural hematoma. And this is from bleeding in the potential space between the dura and arachnoid membranes. It's caused by tearing of bridging veins, generally due to trauma. And risk factors include anyone with cerebral atrophy. And this includes patients who are elderly or have alcohol use disorder. Patients who are anticoagulated are also at risk. These patients will typically present with an acute um, subdural headache. They'll have headache after trauma, and they may even be comatose. A small percentage of patients have a chronic subdural hematoma, and these present with more insidious onset of headache or mental status change. The management is to intubate if the patient has a Glasgow coma score less than or equal to eight, and of course, consult neurosurgery. An epidural hematoma is bleeding in the potential space between the dura and the skull. It's caused by arterial bleeding in 85% of the time. And this is usually from the middle meningeal artery. Patients will present uh, with some uh, loss of consciousness immediately after the trauma, followed by a lucid interval, and then they deteriorate. The management is surgical evacuation um, of the hemorrhage, typically by neurosurgery if uh, focal neurologic deficits are present. Okay, so what is a talk and die syndrome? Patients will be reading the news. Uh, there was a famous actress named Natasha Richardson who died of an epidural hematoma back in 2009. And when she had a um, relatively minor head injury on a ski slope and was checked out by EMS on, on scene and uh, did not seek medical treatment. She later had, uh, and that was her lucid interval. Um, she then had deterioration and died of her epidural hematoma. And when this happens in the news, patients will often come in uh, concerned that they have this as well. So here's another way of um, distinguishing and remembering the difference between subdural hematomas and epidural hematomas. A subdural hematoma um, looks like a banana and it's concave or crescent shaped. It's caused by um, damage to the bridging veins and it often occurs in the elderly and those with alcohol use disorder. Epidural hematomas, uh, tend to look like a lemon, and they are convex and lens-shaped, involve the middle meningeal artery, and patients will often have a lucid interval. Um, this is a patient that I had a couple of years ago. It was a 16-year-old girl who developed a severe headache while she was driving uh, in the car with her father, and she came in um, with mental status change. Her Glasgow coma score was less than eight, so I intubated her and sent her to head, uh, for head CT, and this is what that showed. So she had um, an, an um, 
intracerebral or intraparenchymal uh, bleed from an uh, arterial venous malformation, which we found after she had neurosurgery. So we stabilized her in the community emergency department and sent her by air ambulance to a tertiary care center. Um, she made a complete recovery and uh, sent me a thank you note along with her father as well. And um, sometimes when things get rough in emergency medicine and um, you know feeling down, I do like to remember the good saves that I have had, and this is one of them. So this is just a review again of the different types of brain hemorrhage that we've just gone over. Um, you can see down here, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and we spoke about subdural hemorrhage, epidural hemorrhage, and intracerebral hemorrhage. Next, I'm going to talk about a rare um, disorder called venous sinus thrombosis, and this is a blood clot in the venous sinuses of the brain. These patients will present with a headache 90% of the time and will often have blurry vision and sometimes syncope. Uh, risk factors, this is much more common in women than men, and also in anybody with a hypercoagulable state. So the same risk factors for PE would also um, be a risk factor for venous sinus thrombosis. The diagnosis, um, typically you'd get a CAT scan of the head first, um, but these can be, um, CAT scans can be negative in 30% of cases. So the diagnostic um, modality of choice is the MR venogram, and that's typically diagnostic. And here we see an MR venogram in the photo. Uh, management is with anti anticoagulation, and these patients may need neurosurgery or um, interventional radiology. Uh, this has been uh, increasing in um, uh, incidence and prevalence after COVID, uh, because as you know, COVID-19 can cause an increased risk for PE and can also cause an increased risk of um, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Uh, bacterial meningitis, an important cause of um, headache of severe um, etiology. Um, patients will present with fever and meningismus. Um, patients will need to have a lumbar puncture, uh, but not every patient will need a CT scan prior to having a lumbar puncture performed. You do need to perform a CT before LP if the patient is immunocompromised, has a CNS disorder, a new seizure, focal neurologic deficit, mental status change, or papilledema. And CSF uh, will show white cells greater than 1,000. Predominance will be neutrophils. They'll also have increased protein, and decreased glucose. The CSF to serum glucose ratio will be less than 0.4. It's important not to delay antibiotics in these patients. You can start antibiotics before you even perform the lumbar puncture. And also remember to give dexamethasone before or with the antibiotics. The antibiotic choice will depend on the age and what you're suspecting. Um, if you have a neonate uh, less than one month old, you do need to cover for listeria. Um, and in older patients, those with alcohol use disorder, um, you'll also need to cover for gram negative rods. So you can look at this list or look it up before you treat with antibiotics, depending on your patient's um, age and if they're immunocompromised or had head trauma or recent neurosurgery. Pseudotumor cerebri is also known as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And this is from having too much um, cerebral spinal fluid. Patients will present with headache and blurry vision. Risk factors are women, um, in patients with increased body mass index, and certain medications such as lithium. Uh, the diagnosis is made by um, finding an elevated intracranial pressure with normal CSF, and a head CT will be normal. Uh, management is weight loss, diuretics, uh, remove the offending medication if that's the cause and also to remove cerebral spinal fluid. And this can be done by doing repeat taps or by putting in a shunt or drain. And here is just an example of what the normal optic disc looks like and what papilledema looks like. And if you're not very confident in your uh, fundoscopic exam skills, I'd recommend you practice that. Uh, but there is another modality also to um, measure the, uh, for increased intracranial pressure. And you can use the ultrasound to measure the optic nerve. So what you'd want to do is use um, your linear probe um, on the eyeball, and you would measure three millimeters uh, uh, from the retina, and you're gonna measure the diameter of the optic nerve sheath, and it should be less than five millimeters in adults. <laughs> 
Another cause of headache is giant cell arteritis, also known as temporal arteritis. And this is caused by um, arterial inflammation. Uh, patients will present with headache, jaw pain, and visual disturbance. They'll often typically have tenderness over the temporal artery. Risk factor is age greater than 50. It's also closely linked with polymyalgia rheumatica. Diagnosis is by biopsy and treatment is with high dose steroids. It's important to treat these patients and make this diagnosis because patients can become blind and it can also affect the other eye. I just wanna quickly go over a couple of other types of headaches. You can look at these images. Uh, cluster headaches typically present with sharp stabbing pain behind the eyes. Migraines are typically on one side of the head and face. Um, they're recurrent and severe. I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. Sinus headaches, patients with sinus infections or sinus pressure, um, they'll be tender over the sinuses of the face. Tension headaches are very, very common. Uh, this will be a band-like headache around the forehead. and There'll often be muscular tension in the neck. And then uh, TMJ or temporal uh, mandibular joint inflammation or irritation, uh, that'll typically be worse with chewing and patients will have tenderness over the TMJ. A few other headaches I need to um, address. Uh, one is trigeminal neuralgia. And if patient has irritation of the first um, division of the trigeminal nerve, they'll present with um, a headache in this distribution. Um, shingles also will present with um, herpetic lesions. And if it involves uh, the trigeminal nerve, uh, they can have pain and headache over that portion of the head. It's important to keep in mind that sometimes shingles will present with pain first, um, only to be uh, followed by the rash a day or two later, but it's difficult to make the diagnosis of shingles without actually seeing the rash. Carbon monoxide poisoning is very important to keep in mind. Um, that if you treat the patient with oxygen, they would likely survive, um, but if you don't make the diagnosis, other people uh, can be harmed or patient um, can be reaffected. And then finally, acute angle closure glaucoma. These patients will present with um, headache, um, eye pain. There will be redness of the sclera and then a fixed midpoint range pupil on the affected side. We see a lot of migraines. I'm going to go over this briefly. Uh, migraines are severe recurrent headache. Uh, the presentation is usually unilateral. Patients will often complain of nausea, vomiting, photophobia. It's typically worse with exertion. Uh, risk factors include a family history, and there are certain triggers, and these are commonly menses, certain foods, stress, and exercise. When treating a migraine, it's very, very important to avoid opiates. This can cause dependence as well as rebound headaches. You can treat them with IV fluids, anti-inflammatories, metoclopramide. Um, some people will treat uh, with Benadryl along with the metoclopramide or Reglan uh, for dystonic reactions, but newer research is suggesting that we should just reserve the diphenhydramine if the patient develops a dystonic reaction from the metoclopramide, and that happens about 10% of the cases. So it's always important to warn patients before you give them metoclopramide that they might feel jittery or shaky afterwards. My favorite management for headaches is an occipital nerve block. And I'm going to show you how to do that in the next slide. You can also do a sphenopalatine block um, by using 4% lidocaine, and that can be placed on a Q-tip and placed in the nose, or it can be administered um, with a nasal atomizer. So to perform an occipital nerve block, um, this is very beneficial because you can do it immediately. You can do it before a patient has an IV and patients will often get relief of their symptoms within a few minutes. Um, so the greater occipital nerve, you can see over here, it originates here in the base of the neck, and you can actually palpate the area right in the occipital groove, and patients will have pain along this distribution. So I have a video here of a friend who was suffering from a migraine during the pandemic, did not want to go to the emergency department. So this is a brief explanation of how to perform the occipital nerve block. All right, so we're just injecting the right greater occipital nerve here. Just feel for the groove. Just injecting a little bupivacaine. It will poke and burn. Aspirate, make sure you're not in a vessel. Inject. You can pretty much bury the long 27 gauge needle. And I'll just inject as I'm pulling out. 
Okay, anytime you use a local anesthetic, such as lidocaine or bupivacaine, you do need to be aware of local anesthetic systemic toxicity or LAST. Um, if you're using lidocaine, the maximum dose is five milligrams per kilogram. If you add epinephrine, you can go up to seven milligrams per kilogram. For nerve blocks, um, for headaches and migraines, I like to use bupivacaine, and the maximum dose is 2.5 milligrams per kilogram if not using epinephrine. Um, bupivacaine um, and lidocaine, they can both cause last. And this chart over here shows you um, the symptoms that patients will typically develop with increasing um, systemic toxicity. And it's important to note that patients who get bupivacaine, they can skip over some of the initial neurologic findings, go right to cardiorespiratory um, issues. So typically you'll have numbness of the tongue first, followed by lightheadedness. You may have visual and auditory disturbances, muscular twitching, unconsciousness, convulsions, coma, respiratory arrest, and cardiac arrest. This is very rare and it can be avoided by making sure you stay within the safe um, dosages and by injecting slowly and always aspirating to make sure that you're not in a blood vessel. And this is a summary slide um, from um, Wiki um, EM to uh, help you with your decision uh, tree on how to diagnose a headache. So first, if you have a patient who presents with a headache, you wanna know if they have a history of headaches. Um, if they do have a history of headaches, you would wanna know if there's a change in their symptoms. If there's no change in their symptoms, the patient likely has a tension headache or migraine headache, or maybe they've overused analgesics or um, um, opiates. Uh, they could have a tension headache with a trigger point or a cluster headache. If there is a change in the patient's symptoms, then you wanna go down this alternative pathway over here. Uh, so if uh, a patient does not have a history of headaches, the next question you want to ask, or if their headache's different, do, do you suspect an infection? If you do, you want to think about meningitis. Okay, so you'd want to uh, diagnose them here with a lumbar puncture. If there's any suspicion for a mass lesion, such as they have a focal deficit, papilledema, or if they're immunocompromised, you'd want to do a head CT first. If there's no uh, concern for infection, uh, next thing you want to ask, is there concern for a subarachnoid hemorrhage? That would be a patient presenting with their first or worst headache, or if they have a thunderclap headache. Of course, also um, patients with trauma, you'd also want to go down this pathway. So you would next do a CT scan. If the CT scan is negative, again, we can um, uh, think about doing a lumbar puncture. Um, if the CT scan is positive, or if there's anthrochromia or concern on the lumbar puncture for blood, then you'd want to consult neurosurgery. Um, if you're not concerned about a um, severe headache, such as uh, subarachnoid, uh, if there hasn't been major trauma, you want to think about some other things that would cause headache, such as central venous thrombosis, glaucoma, um, carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis, and trigeminal neuralgia. So in summary, we have discussed um, red flags for um, headaches um, and who you should be concerned about. And the mnemonic you can use is SNOOP or first, worst, and neurologically cursed. We've discussed serious causes of headache, including subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hematoma, epidural hematoma, intracerebral hemorrhage, venous sinus thrombosis, and meningitis. And then other causes of headache, including giant cell or temporal arteritis, pseudotumor cerebri, migraines, cluster headaches, sinus headaches, tension headaches, uh, temporal mandibular joint pain causing a headache, trigeminal neuralgia, carbon monoxide poisoning, shingles, and acute angle closure glaucoma. And we've also learned how to do an occipital nerve block. This is my contact information below. And here are some resources that will be available to you. Finally, I'd like to invite you all to join the JEDI uh, section of AAEM if you're not already members. And the purpose of this section is to promote and increase diversity through the practice of uh, throughout the practice of emergency medicine at every um, level of leadership, and also to actively support and mentor underrepresented minorities and culture champions. Thank you very much. <laughs>